Tonight on Wings, take off with the Discovery Channel and Soviet air power. New data on Soviet aircraft technology has had a sobering effect on many military leaders. Once thought to deploy only sheer quantity, the new Soviet air power consists of highly sophisticated jets rivaling any in the West. The Soviet's latest aircraft, the MiG-27 Flogger and the MiG-29 Fulcrum, employ advanced avionics and missile technology. These jets are a match for anything the West has in the air. Tonight, soar high with Soviet air power on wings. Recent events in the Soviet Union point to a dramatic decay in that nation's might, influence, and unity. But in spite of all this political turmoil, the USSR's formidable arsenal of air power remains the world's only credible threat to American dominance of the skies. Just as there are many Soviet republics, so too are there many Soviet air forces. They include autonomous air armies, the frontal or tactical aviation group, and military transport aviation. Showing no signs of the fractures affecting the USSR, they remain unified as the Soviet Air Forces, or VVS. Right from its birth, Russia, and later the Soviet Union, has felt itself surrounded by enemies. From the Mongol tribes of Genghis Khan, to Napoleon, to Hitler, time and again, invading armies have ravaged the land. Even during the Russian Civil War of 1918, Western troops fought alongside white Russian armies in an attempt to defeat the Bolsheviks. Indeed, Lenin proclaimed that the capitalist nations would forever try to destroy this pioneer communist state. This age-old suspicion of the outside world has always prompted the state to maintain huge armed forces. By the 1930s, the Soviet Union was eager to display the achievements of its nationwide centralized planning. Embodying this desire was the Antonov-20 Maxim Gorky, largest aircraft in the world. The flagship of a propaganda squadron, it often flew escorted by fighters to accentuate its huge size. The rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s threatened the fledgling Soviet state. But the Red Army, weakened by terrible internal divisions, and with many of its key officers killed in Stalin's purges, was not ready to repel an invasion. On June 22, 1941, Hitler unleashed five million troops against the USSR. The resulting conflict saw an estimated 30 million Soviets lose their lives. This war against Germany was known by the Soviets as the Great Patriotic War. The Luftwaffe was ordered to destroy the cities. To defend their motherland, thousands of young men and women from all over the Soviet Union joined the Air Defense Group, which included barrage balloons, anti-aircraft guns, and fighters. The battle for control of the air over the cities was long, bloody, and hard. The most numerous fighters were the Yaks, of which over 37,000 were built, more than any other type of fighter in history. This despite the fact that in the fall of 1941, to avoid being bombed, production facilities had to be moved far to the east, often to places where there were no railways and only dirt roads. But there was never a shortage either of fighters or of pilots. No fewer than 93 members of the air defense group were recognized as heroes of the Soviet Union, an honor never bestowed lightly. These BF 110s, 109s, and FW 190s were among the more than 7,300 fascist aircraft confirmed as destroyed by the air defense group whose equipment was swelled by large numbers of American Air Cobras and British Hurricanes. The tide began to turn in favor of the Soviet Union. A lasting bond of friendship was formed with France, whose pilots formed a special unit, the Normandie Neiman Regiment. With 237 confirmed victories, it was by far the top scoring French unit of World War II.
Now, many thousands of families in the Soviet Union have seen fathers, sons, and even grandsons serve in the defense of the motherland. In the Great Patriotic War, David Kachuk flew no fewer than 820 combat missions, mostly in SB-2 bombers. Not many details have filtered through to the outside world about the massive Soviet bomber campaign, which put down more bomb tonnage on the fascist heartlands than the combined weight of the RAF and U.S. Army Air Force. David had two sons, both of whom serve today. No Air Force in the world has a greater sense of history than that of the VVS, the Central Air Forces of the Soviet Union. Virtually every cadet visits the Air Force's museum at Monino to see the actual Levochkins, Yaks, and MiGs that drove off the invaders. After graduating from high school, thousands of cadets each year start on the long road that leads to being a Soviet combat pilot. Right at the start, remotely piloted model airplanes are used to instill a feeling of air combat and a sense of how to achieve a dominant tactical position. These youngsters plan to go on to a military air school, where they'll be instructed and monitored by political officers. In past times, great emphasis was placed on ideological purity, patriotism, and political dogma. Also important is the use of gliders. Here at the Vanitsa Aero Club in the Ukraine, Czech-built Blanek tandem seat training gliders are used as the first step in basic flight training. This young man is the third generation of his family to devote his life to the VVS. Most pilots train on gliders at their nearest aero club. Many then go on to a very demanding aerobatic training on such agile aircraft as the Su-26 or Yak-55 and the Yak-53, here practicing in formation. Probably the best aerobatic trainers in the world. With such practical flight training behind them, the cadets feel ready to face the tough course at an Air Force Flight Academy. Here they are cut down to size and reminded that every mission starts from the ground and must be properly planned. Traditionally, their political training is also intensified. Before any pilot gets into the cockpit, he must perfect his skills in repeated sessions on electronic simulators. After weeks of training, at last comes the thrill of the first flight. The standard jet trainers are built in Czechoslovakia, the L-29 Delphin, seen here, and the L-39 Albatross. Both are tough all-metal aircraft, much more advanced than anything the cadet has seen before. On his first flight, he's really little more than a passenger. But over the coming months, he becomes not just an able pilot, but totally at home under the most demanding circumstances. At last comes graduation, when the most able cadets pass out as fully qualified Soviet pilots, ready for posting to a combat training unit. First comes a combat training regiment, the kind known in the West as a combat crew training wing or operation conversion unit. Here the eager fledglings are introduced to MiG-21s. This tailed Delta Wing fighter serves with more air forces than any other aircraft. Those used for training are unpainted but in every other respect, they are characteristic of those serving in combat units. After honing their flying skills and familiarizing themselves with the partial pressure flying suit and helmet, the course continues. Each pilot is already accomplished in formation flying, but now he has to deal with Mach 2 power and performance. 
Each mission flown provides that extra bit of knowledge and experience in the handling of fast jet fighters. Eventually, at the end of the course, successful pilots are ready for their first assignment to an operational unit within the gigantic force called Frontal Aviation, there to fly alongside the best Soviet pilots in the air. The MiG-21 has got to be one of my favorite airplanes. I really enjoyed the, uh, the F-14s, of course, uh, which was a much more complex airplane than the MiG-21, a much more capable airplane than the MiG-21, but you paid a certain price in the amount of time it took you to get the thing pre-flighted and started up and get all the systems up and operating. So the MiG-21 combines uh, a lot of really good performance uh, while being very straightforward and simple and, and kind of quick and dirty, if you will, to get the thing up in the air. So the, that, that airplane would have to count as one of my favorites as a fighter pilot in, in three, different, uh, three different cruises. And it's an airplane that we were always trained and, and ready to be on the lookout for. Uh, so it's been, it's been real interesting to go see how it compares to what we thought it was going to be like go see how it actually flies compared to what our literature said on it and and it's a and it's real impressive this MiG-21 memorial commemorates a Soviet pilot who rammed his aircraft into an intruding plane beyond the gate is a frontal aviation base in the giant region of Siberia in the Far East One of the officers stationed there is Anatoly Kachuk, younger son of wartime bomber pilot David Kachuk. Anatoly Kachuk's regiment is equipped with the MiG-21 BIS, many thousands of which have been built for the Soviet frontal air forces. his father left off, Anatoly teaches his pilots how to navigate and how to win in air combat. Frequent flights are made with pairs of aircraft, usually carrying UV-1657 unguided rocket pods. Pilots are instructed in how to attack ground targets with unguided rockets and also with the twin 23mm internal cannon. In the air combat role, MiG-21s often fire the K-13A missile, which homes by sensing the infrared emissions from the target's tailpipe. The CO from the Far Eastern Republics gives a lesson in interception tactics while emphasizing the absolute need of mastering one's aircraft. Да еще рано открываешь огонь, вот тебе и не дали. Ясно. Строят манел одинаково на установленных дистанциях, интервалах. Все как положено. Коротченко стреляет из нурсов два прямых попадания прямо в двигатель. Using a model of the swing-wing MiG-23, 
he explains the next maneuver expected of his pupils. They will climb more than three miles at 375 miles per hour before performing a split S maneuver to level flight. Whenever possible, pupils walk through the entire mission on a plot marked out on the airfield, each student representing the relative position of his aircraft. But the big hangar doors are soon opened. Pupils and instructors taxiing out in their MiG-23U trainers. Each is capable of over Mach 2, and the MiG-23U was one of the most common combat trainers in the Soviet Frontal Aviation Group. They take off in pairs down a runway whose size matches the vastness of the country. Climbing for altitude, pupils and instructors know that on this mission, they need not wear oxygen masks. They are going to practice the interception of hostile aircraft at medium altitude. Nothing very demanding, but to the inexperienced pilot, the sheer power and complexity of the aircraft poses a real challenge. More than 5,000 miles and eight time zones away from his younger brother Anatoly, we find the frontline regiment of Viktor Kachuk. Armed with the UV-1657 and UV-3257 rocket launcher, this aircraft is another version of the MiG-23, the 23MF. The aircraft's GSH-23L twin barrel cannon are serviced and armed before each mission. In the locker room, the pilots dress for action. Today, their ordnance will include the simple K-13A air-to-air missile with an infrared homing head. As usual, Viktor Kachuk will lead the aircraft detailed for this practice mission. Between them, the aircraft will carry several hundred 57 millimeter rockets, which can be fired in any kind of weather, day or night. always important and the tower quickly gives clearance for successive takeoffs using full afterburner. More aircraft of this type are serving in Soviet frontline regiments than any other combat aircraft in the world. Some NATO critics have suggested that the MiG cannot maneuver very well. They have likened it to a juggernaut truck or a super tanker. Recent experience in the Gulf has lent further support to these critics in that mass-produced Soviet military hardware was simply not up to par with the more complex Western systems. Arriving over the target, Kachuk and his men roll over into dive attacks and taking careful aim, fire their salvos of supersonic rockets. Frontal aviation probably goes through more rockets in a year than the rest of the world's air forces combined. Some of the aircraft are carrying bombs, and others, cluster dispensers. Guided by radar, the MiGs head for home. hour later, landing gears extended. They land one after another, slowed by their drag chutes.
I'm Hoot Gibson, MIG pilot for Combat Jets Flying Museum. Wings will be right back on the Discovery Channel. Connect to this. Throughout the endless frontier of the Soviet Union, tens of thousands of radar installations operated by the PVO, or Air Defense Group, keep watch for hostile aircraft or missiles. Among them are the biggest and most powerful radars in the world. Small surveillance and target tracking radars are used in great numbers by the PVO ZR, or surface to air missile troops. All PVO forces in each area are controlled from hardened command centers, coordinating all radar and defense forces. Every day, hundreds of target engagement and tracking radars are put on alert. The troops respond instantly, treating every exercise as a real attack. Launch crews dash down into hardened bunkers to prepare and control launch facilities for the world's most common surface-to-air missile, the SA-2, more than 100,000 of which were built over the years. Many of these large but aging weapons are at readiness on fixed sites. Many thousands of SA-2s are brought up on trucks for reloading. Often they travel a long way through rough territory, and the exercise sharpens every man's performance, cutting precious seconds off the time needed to get into action. Each week, several thousand new men, almost all of them conscripts, are trained in the complex duties of manning PVO ZR missile sites. The newcomers are given special attention so that each unit's performance will remain at peak effectiveness. Sometimes missiles are actually fired. Each shot aimed at a remotely piloted target. Unlike the NATO nations, the Soviet Union has a specialized military air transport force, the VTA. One of its chief types is the tremendously capable Ilyushin 76MD. Powered by four D30KP-1 turbofan engines, each fitted with a thrust reverser, the IL-76 can operate from short, rough airstrips with a full payload of close to 50 tons. Anyone who flies the 76 feels he can truck anything, anywhere. The VTA trains all of its crews to feel like this. A recently qualified pilot makes his first trip on the flight deck of a 76 belonging to a VTA unit which has received many state awards for its proficiency. first indoctrination flight is quite short. Under control from the tower, the 76MD returns to its runway, briefly using reverse thrust. There are many of these aircraft at the base taking part in a combined arms exercise. Various loads go aboard, including ASU-85 assault guns and BMD light armored carriers. At the tail of each aircraft are multiple 23mm cannons to provide radar-directed firepower against any hostile fighter. The crews of the big Ilyushins are in constant readiness. Some aircraft are carrying 125 highly trained parachute troops. Others have armored vehicles, artillery, and other heavy loads, all tasked to capture and hold objectives on the ground. If they can make a landing, then they can evacuate sick and wounded. Setting forth at over 465 miles per hour, a new member of the regiment is making his first simulated combat mission in the role of co-pilot. The paratroops settle in for a long flight.
Below the cockpit, another crew member, the dispatcher, pinpoints the landing zone through radar and downward-looking observation windows, then gives the green light for the airdrop. First go the heavy loads, including the armored vehicles. As each load nears the ground, its fall is suddenly slowed by powerful retro rockets which soften the landing. Then come the troops with their equipment. In seconds, they fill the sky. A few more seconds, and they're on the ground, ready for action. Within minutes, a mobile armored force with formidable firepower is assembled and begins advancing. While the airborne forces advance, the big Aleutians are already back at their home airfield. In a real campaign, they would pick up a second load for reinforcements. If the paratroops captured an airfield intact, the big transports could easily insert additional troops without the need of an airdrop. One of the Soviet aircraft industry's greatest achievements was the Tupolev Tu-95, first flown in 1954. Called the Bear by NATO, this amazing aircraft is powered by four huge 15,000 horsepower turboprops. By driving eight-blade counter-rotating propellers with their giant blades set at extremely coarse angles, this aircraft is able to combine the fuel economy of propeller drive with the speed of a jet. More remarkably, different versions of the Bear have been in production for over 35 years. These noble aircraft come in several different models. Originally designed as a high-altitude strategic bomber, the Tu-95 and today's Tu-142 now rumble over most of the northern hemisphere. Few aircraft in history can claim an unrefueled combat radius of over 5,000 miles and an effective range of more than double that distance. Common versions of the Bear range across the world's oceans. The Bear D maritime reconnaissance aircraft has a giant belly radar, and the Tu-142 Bear H cruise missile carrier has a new airframe and totally different equipment. Even though it is often closely shadowed by U.S. tactical aircraft, such air power enabled the Soviet Union to take its place as one of the world's true superpowers. Though now suffering through a time of great internal transition, the VVS remains an unmitigated asset, an asset enabling the USSR to stand nearly equal to the United States in its ability to deploy military power around the globe. on the Discovery Channel. Those seeking a commission with a frontline squadron of the VVS usually graduate from the Gagarin Academy, where technical and political training is extremely thorough. Graduates can't imagine anything more exciting than going on to pilot the fastest fighter in the world, the massive MiG-25. 
To this day, they are instructed in the dual control MiG-25U. On the very first indoctrination mission, they may well climb to a height of 82,000 feet. At such a height, the sky is dark violet and the air is terribly thin. But at Mach 3, the journey back doesn't take very long. The trainer's second cockpit replaces the interceptor's huge radar, but the plane still has four large missile pylons and continuous wave target illuminating pods on the wingtips. After completing the MiG-25 course, the top pilots are posted to combat regiments equipped with MiG-25 interceptors. Even carrying four of the biggest air-to-air -air missiles in the world, the colossal combined thrust of two R-31 engines fires the 37-ton fighter down the runway like a bullet. On a practice intercept, each aircraft carries two radar-guided missiles and two infrared homing missiles. Even with this load, the MiG-25 can intercept an intruder up to 900 miles from its base and then return. The most numerous aircraft in today's frontal aviation group is the MiG-27. The MiG-27 is a close relative of the MiG-23, but with a totally different front end and an engine installation designed for air-to-ground missions at low level. The MiG-27 is a tough, well-equipped and popular aircraft, and the temporary CEO of this tactical unit, Viktor Salnikov, enjoys leading his men. Here they go on a training mission at dusk. The R-29-300 engine gives tremendous performance and rugged reliability at low level. The different versions of this aircraft are very fully equipped to find surface targets and survive enemy air defenses. Today, the Soviet military's Mikoyan Design Bureau has gone far beyond the MiG-27. Well over 500 frontal aviation pilots have qualified on this trainer, the MiG-29UB. A totally new design first flown in 1977, the MiG-29 entered service in 1983, and yet in some respects is as advanced as state-of-the-art Western fighters. The nose of the UB two-seat conversion trainer houses a smaller radar than the single-seat fighter version. Lightweight 30 millimeter cannon is mounted in the left hand wing route and is used in conjunction with a laser rangefinder. To the rear are two electronic warfare protection antenna, which look ahead from the leading edge. The solid fuselage construction is obvious. An unusual feature of the MiG-29 is that on most interceptions, to avoid being detected, the pilot does not use his radar. Above the nose is a large infrared search and track glass ball through which looks the most sensitive passive infrared detector ever fitted to a fighter. When these MiGs arrived at the 1988 Farnborough England Air Show, everyone expected them to put on an exciting flying display. But in the crucial matter of avionics and fire control systems, it was taken for granted that Soviet technology was years behind the West's. American experts told the world that the MiG-29's advanced look-down, shoot-down, pulse Doppler radar was made possible only by stealing the secrets of the radar fitted to the American Hornet. 
It was therefore a shattering surprise to find that the MiG-29A has a radar in which almost every respect outperforms that of the F-18 Hornet, and which, when coupled with the infrared search and trackball, provides unrivaled ability. On takeoff and landing, the huge air inlets of the MiG-29's R-33D engines are shut off to avoid ingesting slush, stones, or water. Instead, the air is drawn in from above. Despite this, the MiG-29A has the amazingly short combat takeoff run of only 790 feet. The pilot can then pull straight up into a vertical climb with the unrivaled climb rate of 65,000 feet per minute. Barnborough, however, one of the surprises came when a MiG pilot stopped his aircraft in midair and let it fall back in a tail slide. MiG pilots have found that by hovering motionless, they can confuse enemy radars, which rely on Doppler effects caused by the motion of the target. Back in July 1986, a special detachment of six MiG-29As of an earlier subtype flew from Kubinka Air Base near Moscow to an airfield in Finland. This goodwill visit gave Western observers their first close-up view of a modern Soviet combat aircraft, even though the MiG-29 had already been flying for nine years. Taking display was put on by a solo performer. Followed by an even more exciting show by four fighters flying in formation. At the time, what was not appreciated was how restrained the display was, not giving the slightest hint of the MiG-29's superb strength, agility, or surplus engine thrust. Today, we have a much better idea of just how powerful the MiG-29 really is. Even with one engine shut down, it maintains a thrust-to-weight ratio that is nearly equal. A good characterization of the MiGs would be that they are maybe not very much in the way of putting them in a showroom to put them on display. They're not going to look quite as pretty as some of the airplanes that we've got, but they get out there and they do the job and they keep operating and they don't break down very much. Connect to this. Turn to Wings on the Discovery Channel. Soviet helicopter designers today rank second to none. The Mill Bureau produced a helicopter in 1956 which dwarfed all others. Even this one, the MI-8, is bigger and more powerful than its western counterpart, the Sea King. And despite its impressive capability, which includes an internal payload of over 8,800 pounds, over 10,000 of these massive choppers have been built. Vehicles can drive in through the rear doors. Where a landing might be hazardous, troops can rappel down a rope to the ground. MI-8 helicopters have been exported to at least 40 countries, including Finland. Large numbers of MI-8s played a central role in Afghanistan. There, hundreds were deployed, serving with both Soviet and Afghan government troops. they encountered surprisingly heavy fire from the Mujahideen. 
To try to crush all resistance, heavily armed Mi-24 helicopters were also used in Afghanistan. The big gunship helicopter can fly attack, anti-tank, troop transport, electronic warfare, and special reconnaissance missions. An indication of the performance capabilities of the Mi-24 was provided when it set a world speed record of 229 miles per hour in 1978. During army exercises, the Soviets use Mi-24s and fixed-wing attack aircraft in conjunction with rapidly moving ground forces. These troops are frequently equipped with light armor to break through the enemy's defenses. Mi-24s are also used in the anti-tank role. They are also often used to support river crossings and the seizure of strategic objectives. The use of attack helicopters coupled with an armored thrust can be devastating. In the real war in Afghanistan, things were tougher, and convoys of trucks often brought back shot-down helicopters and even IL-28 jet bombers. Like the Mi-8, the Mi-24 gunship was deployed to Afghanistan in large numbers. One of the few anti-aircraft weapons available to the Mujahideen was the small Stinger missile. To counter this weapon's infrared homing head, Soviet aircraft released bright flares, the standard infrared countermeasure. Here, an Mi-24 gunship flies over a stinger well within range, but the missile fails to lock on target. To help support the beleaguered Sandinista government in Nicaragua, the Soviet Union supplied 30 large helicopters in 1986, including six of these Hind Ds. They are fully equipped with all the electronics needed for night and bad weather operations, and are the only machines of their type in the Western Hemisphere. They have been used mainly for the tactical support of troop-carrying helicopters, but can themselves carry troops in the rear cabin. Like all Soviet equipment, the Mi-24 is tough and designed to survive in harsh environments. Many Western observers have scorned Soviet design as being crude and backward, but each Soviet weapon is the end product of a very carefully considered design process. Tough, rugged aircraft built to endure a variety of climates and combat situations. through the brush and go on the hunt. From chilly Alaska to a sweltering Africa, watch out. High action and adventure continues on Wild Discovery. Coming up only on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. numbers of Mi-8s played a central role in Afghanistan. There, hundreds were deployed, serving with both Soviet and Afghan government troops. There, 
where they encountered surprisingly heavy fire from the Mujahideen. To try to crush all resistance, heavily armed Mi-24 helicopters were also used in Afghanistan. The big gunship helicopter can fly attack, anti-tank, troop transport, electronic warfare, and special reconnaissance missions. An indication of the performance capabilities of the Mi-24 was provided when it set a world speed record of 229 miles per hour in 1978. During Army exercises, the Soviets use Mi-24s and fixed-wing attack aircraft in conjunction with rapidly moving ground forces. These troops are frequently equipped with light armor to break through the enemy's defenses. Mi-24s are also used in the anti-tank role. They are also often used to support river crossings and the seizure of strategic objectives. The use of attack helicopters coupled with an armored thrust can be devastating. In the real war in Afghanistan, things were tougher, and convoys of trucks often brought back shot-down helicopters and even IL-28 jet bombers. Like the Mi-8, the Mi-24 gunship was deployed to Afghanistan in large numbers. One of the few anti-aircraft weapons available to the Mujahideen was the small Stinger missile. To counter this weapon's infrared homing head, Soviet aircraft released bright flares, the standard infrared countermeasure. Here, an Mi-24 gunship flies over a stinger well within range, but the missile fails to lock on target. To help support the beleaguered Sandinista government in Nicaragua, the Soviet Union supplied 30 large helicopters in 1986, including six of these Hind Ds. They are fully equipped with all the electronics needed for night and bad weather operations, and are the only machines of their type in the Western Hemisphere. They have been used mainly for the tactical support of troop-carrying helicopters, but can themselves carry troops in the rear cabin. Like all Soviet equipment, the Mi-24 is tough and designed to survive in harsh environments. Many Western observers have scorned Soviet design as being crude and backward, but each Soviet weapon is the end product of a very carefully considered design process. Tough, rugged aircraft, built to endure a variety of climates and combat situations. through the brush and go on the hunt. From chilly Alaska to a sweltering Africa, watch out. High action and adventure continues on Wild Discovery. Coming up only on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world.